What is so what is Venebra trying to do in this essay? I, I think the one way to think of it is that he's trying to give us a way, perhaps a more rigorous and explicit way than Epicurus himself did, but to give us a way of conceiving of death in an Epicurean way. And, and one of the things that he, excuse me for the cat, <laughs> one of the things that he does in the beginning, there you see him, okay, Kramer, one of the things that he does in the beginning is to uh, reject the notion that death should be thought of as some kind of state. As he says, death is not a state that characterizes anything. Uh, for instance, the notion that somehow or another death is uh, a, a, some sort of phenomenal state, some, some sort of state that can be described, um, for instance, what the state of being dead is, is really not something that's conceptually coherent. Uh, it would be a state of that would be complete nothingness or experiencelessness state, and that that is really not the way to think of death and Van Ever's way. Rather, that death is is a limit or an end, uh, rather than a thing in itself. It's not a state. It's the limit or the end of a state, and that state would be the temporal state, the temporal process of being alive. And uh, uh, that would seem to be a explicit statement of, of what the Epicurean notion is. Uh, it's not a state. Death is not a state that characterizes anything. Death should be thought of rather as a limit of something. Uh, and as we see in this essay, a limiting function is what will eventually uh, be suggesting the, the the way that we should think of death. Now the the first thing that he really works off of is a very famous thing that was uh, mentioned by Wittgenstein, the 20th century philosopher Ludwig Wittgenstein, in this uh, first section, this quote, uh, our life has no end in just the way in which our visual field has no limit. Now, what did Wittgenstein mean by that? Well, I think that he meant something, and I think that Van Evers' interpretation of Wittgenstein bears this out, that, that Wittgenstein meant something very much in line with what Epicurus was saying. Our life has no end in the way that our visual field has no limit. Now, when, when Wittgenstein says our life has no end, he certainly doesn't mean that we're immortal or that we never die or that we live forever. Living in the city is an interesting thing. Cats and car alarms and such. He certainly didn't think that our life is, is, is endless in the sense that our life has no... no, no um, no, no, no. Well, no end in the sense that it goes on forever, but it has no end in the way our visual field has no limit. <coughs> Which is to say, <coughs> as, as uh, Van Ever says um, uh, on page 171, he says, of course, saying that from the point of view of sight, uh, the visual field has no limit is not to say that the visual field is not limited in any sense. So think of your visual field. The visual field is just what what appears to you in sight, what appears to you in vision whenever you open your eyes. Uh, our visual field has no limit in the sense that uh, whatever we see or whatever is in our visual field uh, is something that we see. Uh, it has no limit in the sense that we cannot see a limit, we cannot perceive a limit. Uh, anything that we see or perceive is within our visual field. It is not the limit of our visual field, yet our visual field is limited. That is, we, we know that whatever we see, we're not seeing everything. Um, whatever is in our visual field, it is not everything that's available to be seen. And, and we know that, for instance, from moving our heads and from looking around and changing our visual field is that um, whatever we're seeing at, at any one moment is limited, is finite. Uh, yet, yet the limit itself can never become something that we see. Uh, the limit or end is something perhaps that's implied, that we know is there because we know that we're not seeing everything, um, but it's not something that we could ever actually see.
That is, if we think of any spatial object, actually, any simple spatial object, for instance, uh, the good old coffee cup, we see the cup, and perhaps we see it in, uh, in its wholeness, in its entirety, uh, but we never see its limits. The limits are not something, for instance, a spatial object is something that's extended in space, uh, and it would seem that anything that we see in our visual field has to be extended. But a limit is not something that has any extension. So a limit is something that could not actually be seen. We, we see the cup, we see it as a limited thing, but we don't see its limits. Well, if we compare that, or we use that as, a, as a, uh, an analogy with, with, with death, our life has no end in just the way our visual field has no limit. Our life has no end in the sense that anything that's within our life is lived experience. Uh, and uh, the end of that experience, the terminus or termination of that experience, couldn't possibly par be part of the experience itself. Yet, we know that our life is limited. We don't experience the limit in just the way that Epicurus suggested that we don't actually experience death. Uh, yet we're aware that our experience is limited. That is, we, uh, just as our visual field uh, is something I c couldn't possibly see everything. We couldn't include everything in our visual field, so we know that our visual field is limited. So in our experience, although the limit never becomes part of our experience, we know that our experience is limited in time. That is, we know that we couldn't, for instance, well, in space, we know that we, we can't experience everything there is to experience. But in time, also, we realize that our experience does not go on forever, and that it is finite, it is limited by something, and that's something that you might say that's limited by is, is in fact, death. <coughs> uh, so, uh, as uh, Van Ever says on page 171, uh, holding that my life has no end in this sense, that is, it's no, there's no end within my life that I could experience, is perfectly consistent with the belief that I will die, in the same way that holding that my visual field has no seeable limit is perfectly consistent with the belief that my visual field is limited. How do we get this notion, though, that our, I mean, if, if death is not something that's within our experience, it's the limit of our experience, but how do we get this notion that our uh, lives are, in fact, finite and limited? Um, he says, I might, for instance, arrive at such a belief by realizing that I experience from time to time bodies which have ceased to function physiologically. From this I infer, as I logically infer, on the basis of the analogy which I draw to my own physiological self, that I too will cease to function physiologically. Then on the basis of the belief that certain physiological functions are necessary for the occurrence of thought and experience, I infer that I will cease to think and experience, that is, that I will die in this particular sense. So what emerges is a notion of death in so far as we realize that our experience is limited, that physiologically other beings have ceased to function, and presumably then all their experience has come to an end, that I too uh, will cease to function. And that notion or that keeping in mind that my experience is limited and finite in just the way that my visual field is limited and finite, that if there are things that I cannot see or there are things, the world goes on beyond my visual field, so the world will go on beyond me, beyond the extension of myself in time. <laughs> okay, these ideas maybe are a little bit uh, an extrapolation from what Van Ever says, but I think this is just the kind of thing I want you to think about that is in terms of Epicurus, how do we actually conceptualize death in Epicurean terms. <laughs> <laughs>